Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. Our guest today is Calvin Pepperall, trained therapist, consultant, and speaker. Calvin, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me, Jason. So, Calvin, you help take care of a lot of people, which we'll get into later on, but how do you take care of yourself? A lot of times people who give and give and give, a lot of times they forget like to take care of themselves, right? So how do you make sure you take time to take care of yourself, whatever taking care of yourself means? You know, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's going to sound weird, right? But like, I recently discovered the magic of taking two showers a day, right? And what I mean by that is in the mornings, you know, before I start working, so if I take a shower, and this is after like, come back from the gym and everything like that. And then, but then after I'm done, right, with seeing clients, talking with folks and everybody like that, right before I go to bed, I take another shower and I feel so refreshed afterwards, right? I, I don't know, well, I guess I do have an idea as to why, right? Like it's being a therapist and working with folks, right? Hearing all these different stories and whatnot. I mean, it's it's kind of given that you will also be impacted, right? By what it is that you are, you know, hearing and experiencing, right? But what's helpful is at the end of the day, it's almost like a ritual, right? Being able to kind of cleanse and wash off all these things that, you know, you've had to kind of take on from other folks, right? So that's definitely one. Another thing too I like to do, I'm thankful that I've got some friends who I think are pretty cool, who you know have host a whole bunch of other events and stuff in the community, right? So it gives me a chance to go out there and actually, you know, kind of meet and engage with people that don't have to do with my work, right? Like aka seeing clients, you know, coming in who are willing to, you know, trying to share their traumatic experience and things like that. So, you know, going out in the community, actually meeting regular people right as they're going about their lives and you know just talking about hey man how's how's your week going right you know yeah man my boss is going crazy I'm like yeah bro that's, that's crazy having a boss huh yeah so like just being able to go out in the community is definitely something too that kind of helps to just rejuvenate me and refresh me as well too so so where do you get the two hours a day thing from do you get it from somebody or you just picked it up so how did it even start that's that's a good question I think one day I was just like, man, I am tired, right? Like, and this was before, um, you know, I was going to bed and stuff like that. And I was like, I remember one time, this went off a whim. I was like, man, I feel kind of gross. I think I like gone to the gym actually later on during that day, right? So usually I go to the gym in the mornings, but this time I think I start, I went to the gym at like 7 or 8 p.m. or something like that. And I was like, all right, I'm not going to go to bed sweaty and everything like that, right? Let me just take a shower, right? you know, right before I go to bed. Yeah, and I was like, okay, that's, that's kind of nice. The next day, I tried it again. I was like, yo, wait a minute. Something's up, and this was after I was done work, right? I was like, wait a minute. This actually feels kind of nice. And then, you know, I think I also just looked into it, right? Like the ritual of like, and what other therapists also do to kind of help with self-care. I did see somebody have posted like, yeah, I just take a shower. It's like, okay, let me try that. So started doing that, and honestly... In terms of like, you know, especially, you know, uh, during Seattle winters, like how cold and gloomy it can get, right? Um, it definitely has been helpful to, you know, kind of help curb that a little bit, that gloominess and stuff. So yeah, it was just off a whim. I went to the gym at the wrong time and I discovered the magic of showers. You know who Al Roker is? This weatherman for NBC. New York, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he actually he's a big proponent of, of uh, two shows a day. Oh, really? And one time he was on his show, like doing stuff, and he like kind of went all in on his on his guest host, right? You only shower once a day? Like, so he's, he's like, so you're telling me you're here all day long in New York City, the subway, you go home to go to bed? Like, what's wrong with you? Right. Well, how, how gross are you, right? Right. Like, wow. Especially like being in Seattle, like, kind of grimy. And mm -hmm. my thing is like, I take two shows a day sometimes, but sometimes I'll be so tired I get home, right? That's right. And then the wife would like, you're nasty. Like, <laughs> stay on that side of the bed. Like, what do you, don't come over here. Uh huh. At least jump in the shower and like run some water over your nasty body or something. Right, right. No, I definitely heard about that. Like, you know, you smell like outside or, you know, you're bringing outside into the bed. And yeah, and I'll be real. Like, before that, I usually just took a shower in the morning, right? Before I start my day and just kind of go. But kind of realized, like, no, there is actually a good point to that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, before you actually lay back down in the bed, it's like, it's like a ritual. You yeah. cleanse yourself of everything that you've just gone through and experienced during this day. And then you go back and lay in bed because the bed is supposed to be where you refresh, yeah. rejuvenate, right? Not so, to, not to, not to work in your bed or exactly. do anything that's yeah, relax. Exactly. Yeah. So to honor that space, cleanse yourself, 
and then enter that space and go off into dreaming. But I'm sure there's probably some environmentalists out there listening. It's like, no, only one shower a week. You waste the water, right? <laughs> yeah, I can know. <laughs> Want to be stanky in the bed? Sure. I don't know. But yeah. do you ever take cold showers? No, I heard about those. I, I, I've tried to do it sometimes. I, I, I would be just like 10, 20 days in a row and like, man, I got to have some warmth in my water, oh, right? Bro. Oh, they all say that it's health benefits and all this stuff you hear on the mm -hmm. internet and all these medical people say it's so great for you. But man, that sometimes you need a hot shower. I'm going to say this. So I was born and raised in Ghana, right? And in Ghana, the weather is like pretty much like summer all year. Like, so we used to take cold showers. I'm going to milk the fact that I'm in America now. And I have a water heater. <laughs> and if I have the privilege to take a warm shower, I'm going to pick that because I feel like for like 11 years, I endured cold showers, right? And now that I have the option to take a warm shower, hell yeah, I'm going to take a warm shower. Like, yeah, and I've done my time with cold showers, you feel me? So now yeah. if it's warm, I'm going to take warm. Yeah, I agree, right? I agree with you, right? Mm -hmm. You don't realize that if you go back maybe 100 years before, yeah. there was no hot showers, right? Exactly. Maybe sooner than that, you know? Yeah. Magic of 21st century, man. Yeah. So I was in the Army. I served two times in Afghanistan. Mm. Each time I was during the wintertime, right? Mm. Like, the, people don't know, in Afghanistan, it's desert, like, it gets snow on the ground, right? Oh, ah, okay. So there's a month that we had no hot water, right? So we're taking cold showers and freezing mm. cold water with mm. the 25 degrees during the snow, right? So, yeah. yeah. Whenever I want to take a cold shower, I kind of think back to that. Like, what am I doing here? Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like you. I've done my time. Right. <laughs> Getting flashbacks. No, I'm good. So when did you... Did you come here with Ghana or took from Ghana by yourself, your parents? How to tell, tell about that story a little bit? Yeah. So I don't know if a lot of people know this, right? And I'm not sure if they still even do it, but back in the day, there used to be this thing called a green card lottery, right? And it was like a worldwide um, lottery that the United States does, I think like once a year or something like that, where, at least from what I remember, they allowed like 50,000 people, right, from around the world to kind of come in, um, get a chance to win. Uh, uh, becoming a permanent resident in the United States. And when that, the year that happened, um, you know, we were in Ghana. My dad was in the Air Force at the time. And yeah, it was like a big deal, right? Everybody was like going crazy about this new, like this lottery, this opportunity, right? To be able to go to America and have a start a new life and everything like that. And my dad, I remember he was like, I'm not really, I don't have, really have any plans to go to America. Like, you know what I mean? I have my family here. I got people here that I know. Why would I do it? But all of his friends were actually applying for it. So he was like, all right, I guess I'm going to give it a try to whatever. I don't really have anything. So then tell me why none of his friends won, but then he won. So now he was like, okay, I didn't have any plans for, you know, coming to America, but I guess it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And, you know, maybe it's a sign that nobody else, nobody else won, but I won. So. I remember I was playing soccer at the time and he calls me over and he's like, Kelvin, hmm. so get ready. We're going to be in America in about a couple months. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. We, so that lottery thing I told you about, so I ended up winning. So um, now we're going to America. So um, yeah, have fun. I was like in shock. I was how, like, how old were you at this time? I was like 10. Came here when I was 11, okay. but it was like 10 and a half around that okay. time. Right. So yeah, I remember I was just like, what, what the hell? What? Because, you know, when you're a kid in Ghana, stuff like that, I remember just was like, oh, my God, I can't wait to go to America one day, blah, blah. We bragging about, you know, we got family or whatever in America. But I, now I'm like, okay, shit, I'm actually going to get to go to America. So that's kind of how I found it up here, just on a, we won a lottery to come to the United States. And we came here, came to Minnesota in November. Oh, Wow. From Ghana? Yes. You you probably like, this wasn't no lottery. Bro, I was like, 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 this is a setup. Yo, real talk. I was like, what the hell are we doing here? Like, yo, no, take me. Dead ass when I got off the plane and I felt that cold, I turned around and was about to go back on the plane. And the guy was like, no, you can't come back here. Go, go we got to go forward. And I'm like, because I was like, why do people live here? So your dad was the Air Force at this time? Mm -hmm. I'm very surprised that Ghanaian government let him go, right? I mean, it's like he's in the Air Force, part of the government. It's not like they were like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, well, I don't know how that works or anything, but. Yeah, no, I think, well, he had done his time, right? Okay. So okay. growing up, uh, my dad was uh, was in like the UN Army, right? So they do like a lot of peacekeeping missions and stuff around the continent. And yeah, I think towards that end, he was kind of like, 
you know, done doing his tours and stuff, and he was doing journalism, rather, um, with the Air Force magazine or something. It was some magazine for the Air Force, so he's one of the journalists there. Um, but yeah, when that happened, they were like, all right, I mean, you still got a pension, so, you know, you've done your time already over here. He was like, all right, cool. So yeah, it was really no problem kind of letting, letting him go. And talk about some of the culture shocks you had to go through coming over here. I'm yeah. sure, I'm sure it's different food. Um, yeah. I guess you already knew English for the kind of, but like this is different things you had to go through. Yeah, it was, it was definitely interesting. Um, but one, it was one of the things I, I thought was really cool was the yellow school bus. Right. So, it, okay, listen, I've been, I may got it right. And one of the things I always thought was hella cool was you, know, you guys have like the school bus, right? Like I used to watch the magic school bus which I love, I love that show. Um, but I remember the first day, you know, I was going to school and they were like, this is where it's going to take you to school. And I saw the, the what's called the magic school bus. So the yellow school bus, I was like, oh, wow, this is actually happening. Because you only see like movies and shows and stuff. And now I got to go in. So I thought it was cool. Um, in terms of culture shock, one thing, and I think a lot of maybe even Africans might resonate with this, right, is like, the idea that I didn't know that I was black until I came to America, right? And the reason I say that is that when you're growing up on the continent, right, when you're growing up in Africa, one, everybody looks like you. So you don't really think about your skin color being something that's like, you know, important or anything like that. But when you come here, when you come to America where there's a lot of different peoples, right, and what they call a lot of different races, yeah, people like to categorize and try to fit you in. It's like, okay, you're black. This is what you do. This is what your people do. And it's like, okay, that's kind of weird. Um, I didn't know that my people specifically did a thing, but here we are, I guess. So yeah, you, you kind of learn the unspoken kind of rules, right, of America, which is that there are different races and different races are known for different things, right? This is what black people do. This is what white people do. This is what Asian people do. This is what Hispanic people do. And I was like, that's why, that's weird. That was a weird thing to me because it's like, what makes it so special to these people that these people don't do this or are known for this? I could do what I could do all of that. Why can't I do all of that? So it was this concept of race is outside of America. Not a lot of people actually think about or see skin color in the same way, but. I think that's to say, too, about the unique experience, though. I've learned the history of this country, right, when it comes to race and skin color and everything like that. So, so um, do you think being coming over here from another country has given you advantage versus, like, regular Americans? Like, do you think immigrants are more, more motivated to be succeed? Like, they take advantage of opportunities where most Americans are like, eh. Well, it's, it's interesting, right, because I've had this conversation, too, with folks, just big black folks, too. And it's like... At one point, you know, I used to think that, right? I used to think like, yeah, like being an immigrant and, you know, kind of coming here, yeah, there is in a sense uh, a different kind of drive, right? Because outside of this, they call America the land of opportunity, right? And when you come here, you're like, oh, okay, so you're telling me, like, I can actually do something. Like in Ghana, for example, if you wanted to start a business, it's kind of, I would say 90% luck that it will succeed, right? Like, one, there isn't really any, I mean, sure, there's like a official administrative process you can go through, right? But one, you don't even actually have to go through that. You can just set up a little you know, canopy somewhere and start selling something. But the odds of that succeeding, right? You even like, one, getting capital for, you know, the thing you're trying to sell, all these other things and whatnot, is difficult, right? So again, it's like a lot of luck of the draw. Whereas when you come here, there are not only, you know, a system for starting a business, but there are things like grants, there are you know, places you can go market yourself, right? It's very much organized and structured here. So if you want to do something, there is like almost like a set path. Okay, you want to open up like, you know, a hospital? All right, boom. Here are the laws that we have for, you know, if you want to be a hospital, here are the paperwork you need to do. So there's already like a way you can, there's a system there. Whereas in Ghana, there isn't so much a organized system. So yeah, I think a lot of immigrants, when they come here, they see that, they're like, okay, this is what I wanted to do, but I couldn't do it in my own country. But when I come over here, I see that there is a system. I'm going to do it. And then they look at maybe other folks and like, how come you guys don't take advantage of this opportunity and system that you have here, right? Like, if you want to do something, you can do it. But 
as I've talked with, you know, specific other black folks and whatnot, come to learn about, well, historically, it's not as black and white, right? Especially when it comes to black folks. Because there have been times when black folks have built something, but then it got pretty much destroyed or bombed or, you know, burned down by other folks in this country, right? So a lot of black folks still kind of carry that trauma in some ways. But then also the awareness that, yeah, there is a history that a lot of immigrants don't know about because it's not like black folks and other folks haven't tried to do the thing that we're saying, right? It's just that we weren't here for it. We don't have the same history as, you know, they do here. And yeah, it's not as simple as folks are just being lazy or something like that. From your point of view, is there like tension between a black person that comes from Africa versus mm -hmm. a black person who was born in America? Yeah. I think the one, again, there's like the history, right? of being born here in this country and the history that comes with that, and then also being, say, African and being on the continent. Because one, one of the things that black folks here say is that they wish they knew, you know, their lineage or like where they came from, right? Being African, yeah, I know where I come from, right? Like I have my family like, oh yeah, you know, we were from here and then we moved here and then we moved here, but here's your, you know, your lineage basically. So I know where I come from. I have, quote unquote, a home country. Right? Um, what else is the what else is the difference? Yeah, there is that strong, and also there is a stronger sense of pride amongst Africans because, again, they know where they come from. Right? They may not also have the same level of intergenerational trauma that Black Americans have here, right? Because of enslavement, right, and Black folks everything that they endured during the Jim Crow era, even after that, and even to this day too, right? There's definitely what we call, and I think Dr. Joy DeGroove wrote about this, right? Post-traumatic slave syndrome. What have been the traumas that have been passed down intergenerationally from folks who were enslaved, right? And how has that been normalized within the black culture that folks might not even be aware of? So there's a lot to unpack when it comes to black Americans. And but people I, forget Jim Crow was on like 50 years ago, right? Exactly. It's not like a century ago. Like people's grandparents or parents lived through that. They were that. there. They were there, yeah. And they saw all of that, right? And so and then these people are like walking around to this day. So it's not like, like exactly like you said, something that happened 200, 300 years ago. Literally happened like a few decades ago. So there is a lot of trauma there, right? A lot of trauma that folks from Africa are privileged not to have. I mean, yes, we had, you know, colonialism and things like that. But at least we can say that we have our own country, whereas other folks here might not have that privilege. Right. And how many times have, have you gone back to Ghana since you've been here? Um, say like three or four times, I think. Yeah, I came here in 2003. I think I've been back like three or four. Okay. Three or four times, yeah. And so, like, I have no idea how many countries are in Africa, right? Mm. But like, as far as like economic status and like all that kind of stuff is Ghana, like in the lower class, middle class, upper class, like, is yeah. that a wall off country? Like, are they struggling or? I mean. Just a generality. So the thing, I think with, you know, every country, right, there's like, you know, the good parts and the bad parts. Um, if you got money, you'd be all right in Ghana, right? If you, you know, come here, make you, you know, make your dollars and things like that, exchange rate, especially now, is definitely to your favor. Um, but in terms of the country as a whole, Ghana could be better. I, I would definitely say that. Um, people are now, you know, starting to develop it and things like that. Uh, we had, I think, the year of return, and it's still ongoing right now where folks, a lot of diasporans, go back to Ghana, like, during the Christmas time and everything. And, you know, it's really fun. There's, like, Airbnb there now. Last time I went back, there was Uber. I was catching Uber and stuff like that. Growing up, yeah, there was no no way. I I. I didn't think there would be Uber, Uber, actually. I was shocked when I went down there and actually could call an Uber. So it's, it's slowly developing. But I think leadership could be better. Um, priorities could be better. Um, other areas, other countries that I've seen are doing well and are more developed. See, there's Kenya, there's South Africa, Ethiopia. Um, even our neighbor Ivory Coast is even, you know, I have to say, a bit more developed. But I would say, like, Middle, low, middle, you know, okay, like that. But it's still, it's still growing. It's still so getting better. I had a good friend. Actually, still a good friend. Um, he was from Ghana. He was a, a helicopter mechanic. He was stationed oh, nice. in Texas, like ninety-five to ninety-eight, right? 
and he was an E4, right? I mean, he don't get paid a lot of money. He would send money home, and he had a, like this mansion built, right? Yeah. For all his family, right? I'm like, how does this work, right? Like, mm-hmm. I know we get paid, we get to pay the same amount. <laughs> and, he, and he had explained to me how the, the dollar, all the stuff worked, right? Yeah. And like, it's like a mansion, right? Just, yeah. just beautiful. Like, man, imagine you actually had money, right? Mm-hmm. We could do over there, yeah. That's back in the 90s, yeah. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. A lot of, a lot of immigrants do do that, right? Because shout out to the dollar. I mean, a dollar is powerful, right? And the exchange rate definitely helps when you are trying to also build something, right? So a lot of folks when they come here, you know, yeah, they are paying their bills and stuff like that. And also sending money back home to kind of help build either if it be a business over there or a house or something like that. So So you know around the world most people want to come to America, right? Mm. Is there a country after where people say, man, I can't make it to America, but let's at least make this country here in the continent. Yeah, South Africa from South what Africa. I heard. Okay. Yeah. You can definitely they also they again they're a bit more developed. I heard like South Africa is almost like the United States of Africa. Okay. Because of it. So can you give us like quick dummies one on one of life in Ghana? Like people never know what's life in Ghana is like, what's like the country's life, what it's like living there, like some just what do you want to talk about? Yeah. I mean, Ghana, one thing that folks can definitely say about Ghana is that it's very peaceful. Right? It's very welcoming. We pride ourselves on the idea of hospitality. So there is this culture of if you have a guest, right, you try to bring out your best for this guest, right? In the sense that when you go over to their place or, you know, wherever they stay, that hospitality is also reciprocated. So definitely a very friendly uh, place, very inviting. Um, yeah, people just, you know, try to live life, right? I remember last time I was back and I was driving with my cousin and stuff, and I just saw a mango tree just on the side of the road, right? Um, and the interesting part was like, it was like dangling off a wall in somebody else's uh, house, like a yard, basically. And I was just thinking to myself, wow, I can't remember the last time I saw a mango tree. <laughs> this thing right there, and it was like, literally, as you can walk by, you walk on the sidewalk, and this thing's like right in your face. You almost have to like duck and stuff, but you could see it ripening, right? So it was like, you could literally just grab the mango, wipe it off and just eat it as you're walking by. And that's everywhere. And I was like, wow, that's crazy because in America, one, that's somebody's property. Two, you would never see a mango tree just dangling off right there. No, that'll be, yeah, that'll be, again, you can try to do that. And three, the only place to get a mango <laughs> is QFC or Red Apple or, you know, yeah. wherever, wherever you go shopping. So, so this is going to be an ignorant question. Uh, but can you start on gone like drive through every country in Africa? I'm sure some countries you don't want to drive through, but it's like some kind of international highway system in Africa. You could go from Ghana to um, so wherever. There isn't a international highway, but there have been people who have driven through pretty much the entire continent, every country, right? So there's like different roads and stuff like that that you have to kind of navigate. But yeah, one, when it comes to borders, right? Africa is interesting in that. Well, our borders weren't created by us, right? They're yeah. created by, you know, colonizers. The British and, and French, yeah. Man, yeah, that those that whole gang. But so that means is that a lot of folks actually are very connected. Like pre-borders and stuff, you know, it was like, I'm just going to go with my cousin over here, you know, um, and they're going to come visit over here. But all of a sudden, you know, somebody in Europe just drew a border in between the path. And I was like, this is a brand new country. And now this is a brand new country. But it's like, my cousin's over there. How am I supposed to get over there? So it wasn't a like border. The idea of borders aren't as strong, right? So, for example, in Ghana and Ivory Coast, it's like I call people, you know, who live in Ivory Coast, like Ghanaians who speak French, <laughs> right? And we just speak English because it's like, like they actually can also speak our native language, but it's like, okay, let's switch to like, you know, a different language. They start speaking French. You're like, whoa, what the heck? Like, that's, that's wild. They look like you, right? Like, well, they look like me. Yeah. So it's like, wow to kind of just see that um so yeah there isn't really a strong sense of borders you know around the continent it's if you want to go over to every country you kind of have to you know get to the border you're like hey you know, i'm trying to come in all right cool here yeah come in just don't don't be crazy out here and those are like back roads and stuff like yeah. that so nice. yeah so what is a lmhc lmhc stands for licensed mental health counselor is that pretty hard to get or yeah, so after graduate school, right, you do your degree and stuff like that. You 
then can apply for what we call an LMHCA, which stands for Licensed Mental Health Counselor Associate, right? And that's the license you get before you've done your, you know, year, uh, 100 hours of supervision, as well as just the hours that you need for face-to-face -face counseling, right? And once you're done with the required, required amount of hours, then you can apply for you know, your full licensure, which is the LMHC. And what, is the, what does it mean to be EMDR trained? EMDR trained means that you've done, let me think how many hours it is. I think it was 20 hours of EMDR training. Um, EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. It's basically a modality that was developed by, I believe her name is Dr. Robin Shapiro, in helping clients treat trauma, right? So it's the, what she discovered was that in the animal kingdom, right? So say a gazelle, you know, a deer, whatever, after being chased by, you know, a predator, right? What they do is that they move their eyes back and forth. Um, and what research has discovered is that that movement, that eye movement back and forth, actually helps your mind process very traumatic experiences, right? What just happened? Kind of makes sense of, okay, this, I was going through the, you know, the, Planes, and then I just got chased by a lion and now I survived and now here I am. Versus when folks are trapped in what we call trauma, right? That processing hasn't happened. So sometimes when they're just walking by, something can maybe trigger, quote unquote, the incident that had happened, the traumatic incident that did happen, and they feel as if they're back again in that situation, right? That's what we call kind of having a flashback moment. And the reason for that is because your mind hasn't processed the thing that happened as something that happened in the past, and now you are okay. So EMDR kind of helps folks process, be able to process those traumatic experiences as just things that happened in the past, and now you're in the present. That, does that like separate you from other therapists? Does you have that versus, versus if you didn't have it? Well, or something you have to have? No, well, no, not necessarily, because there are a lot of different ways of treating, you know, trauma and stuff. And EMDR is just one more doubt. Okay. To, okay. to do that. And you went to Hope College? Did. Where's that at? Hope College is in Holland, Michigan. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when did you figure out that, you know, well, let me backtrack. Like when you're a kid, most people are like, I want to be a fireman, policeman, superhero. I'm pretty sure you didn't wake up one day <laughs> at four and yeah. say, I want to be a therapist or do this line of work. Yeah. How that, talk about the process, how that came about to you deciding like this is your life's work. Man. Okay. So, so let's go back to little Kelvin. Um, yeah, when I was a kid, one thing I really enjoyed doing was people watch, right? I was fascinated by this, just watching people. So when I was a kid, my mom, you know, would take me to take us to markets and stuff like that. And then sometimes she would leave me with somebody like, Hey, you know, can you watch him while I kind of go out and do the shopping? I was like, all right, cool. So I'll just be staying there for a bit, but I'll just be watching people as they kind of going about, you know, doing the market and stuff. And it was so fascinating seeing one person have an interaction with somebody, right? And you the, you could then see, you know, their body language as well as, you know, just the gestures and stuff like that, that they were upset about something. Then this person would leave. This person would be, you know, still kind of maybe fuming in, you know, whatever it is that's happened. And then now a different person or a new person that comes in, attempts to like, you know, interact with them. And they would just kind of blow up. And like, I don't, I'm not on time for this, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't want to talk to you right now. I was like, whoa, what just happened? But because I've been watching them, I was like, ah, I know what happened. Right? I can understand what it is that led to this whole situation kind of just happening. Really loved that. And then when I came to America, went to high school. Um, well, I guess we're in Seattle, I can say it. So me and my friends used to smoke a lot in high school. right? And one of the things that we would do is we just kind of have a little life, you know, conversation about life, right? The meaning of life, existence, and things like that, right? And, you know, we were just kids, but we would just be, like, having these philosophical conversations and stuff like that. And then, I think it was junior year, he told me about this class called AP Psychology, right? He was like, yo, I, like, discovered, you know, this guy named Freud, and, you know, he's really into psychology and stuff. I think, you know, maybe we should check out this AP Psychology class. And I was like, all right, cool, whatever. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a shot. And I remember that first day of that AP psych class, you know, the teacher introducing what psychology was and then reading the textbook and stuff. I remember just looking at him and he was looking back at me like, yo, 
this is the shit we be talking about, man. What the heck? So that's where I discovered, like, there's a whole science behind this thing. Like, there's a whole science about human behavior and, like, why human beings do the things that they do. So that's what kind of led me down the path of psychology. Like, even before I went to Hope, I already knew that I was going to major in psychology because I was like, there's nothing else. Like, like, this is the only reason why I'm here. Like, I want to learn more about psychology. So that's what led me down that path. And junior year again, I think I was, the, uh, you know, I was still trying to figure out, okay, what it is I wanted to do with this psychology degree? Because one, a bachelor's in psychology can is generalizable to pretty much anything, right? So you need to be more specific in what it is that you're going to do with this degree. So that meant getting a graduate degree, right? Either a PhD or a master's. So I was still deciding if I wanted to go down the path of research or, you know, uh, application, which is either therapy, you know, HR, whatever have you. Um, and I remember taking this class called hmm, Theory and, what was it, what was it again? <sighs> ah, I always forget what it's called, but it was about, it was basically a, a class about therapy, right? And it was taught by a therapist. And I really liked the class, right? It was like, whoa, seeing how all these psychological terms and concepts that I've been learning, right, that should be used to help people. So right, let me just take a... Yeah. Hmm. It was like how to use all these psychological terms and whatnot to be able to help people. And I remember really being intrigued by that. And for our final project, we had to do like a mock interview like a mock therapy session, right? It was going to be 15 minutes. And we were supposed to, one, tell whomever we were interviewing, like, hey, I'm not necessarily a therapist. This is just me practicing what it is that, you know, we've been learning in class. And, you know, please just make up something, right? Like, make up a situation. I just want to test my listening skills, basically. My phone's like, yeah, for sure, bet. So, you know, open up the laptop, click record. And tell me why. You know, I told this dude, well, let me rephrase so it was supposed to be 15 minutes. We ended up getting so into it that it ended up being 45 minutes. Like, right by the time I looked at it and to hit stop, I was like, oh, snap, it's been, it's been 45 minutes. And he's like, yeah. He's like, oh, by the way, Kelvin, I think I told you stuff that I never told anybody before. And I'm like, bro, you're not supposed to, <laughs> we're supposed to, you're supposed to make all that up. He's like, yeah, um, you're really good at this, bro. But yeah, please don't tell anybody. I was like, yeah, who am I going to tell? Whatever. So I ended up showing it to my professor. Again, it's all confidential. Showed it to my professor. And I remember, and this still resonates to this day, he's like, she was like, Kelvin, I think you might be the best one in this class. You should just seriously consider being a therapist. And I was like, really? She was like, yeah, like you are really good. Like, I, yeah, I know it was supposed to be long. It was supposed to be short, but this, yeah, that was, that was really good, man. You should really think about it. I was like, oh, yeah, cool. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think Cause I like to me, it came, it came easy, right? Like growing up, I was always that kid that people would just come and sit next to and just start telling their problems to. And I'm like, whoa, what the heck? Like I was just trying to eat my chicken sandwich at lunch, at lunch. And here comes this guy telling me about, you know, what's going on at home and how, you know, how hard it is with his parents. And strangely enough, I would like find myself also like, responding to what he was saying, right? It'll be like, well, it sounds like, you know, your parents are a bit upset that, you know, your grades aren't really doing well. I mean, they they sound like they, they care about you, right? And maybe you should just work on the grades and see how that goes. Like, oh yeah, I never thought about that. And I'm like, what? How did you <laughs> it seemed pretty obvious, but what you think your parents are gonna be okay with you like failing class, you know, skipping school and stuff? Why wouldn't they be but I just say it that way in my mind, I'm like, come on, bro. But yeah. So I'm guessing, like, y'all covered by the medical and confidentiality, HIPAA laws, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. just like every medical person is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The things that we talk about in sessions, one, are confidential. All right, so I can't uh, really discuss or share anything that might be identifiable. To and you. you can't tell the spouse, like, if it's a criminal court case. None of that, right? So there are a few times where, you know, confidentiality is kind of broken. One. Um, I'm what they call a mandated reporter. So in the cases of, say, you know, harm to self, harm to others. Okay. Uh, yeah, harm to others and, you know, just neglect, things like that. 
So like, I have to say something or you know, okay. report to the appropriate authorities. Right? Okay. And also if records are subpoenaed by a judge. Okay. Yeah. Um, what are some differences between a psychologist and a psychiatrist? So if I said that correctly. Yeah, yeah. So a psychologist is typically someone who has a PhD, um, and they can do research as well as therapy. Whereas a psychiatrist can prescribe medication, right? Sometimes they can do therapy, but oftentimes they're more focused on just medication management, right? So, you know, your Vyvanse, your Adderall and whatnot, they can prescribe that, whereas they, because uh, they go through medical school for that. But a psychologist doesn't. Can't so do you have that. a goal of getting your PhD one day? Yeah, my dad wants me to get it. He's one don't, see him, don't sound too, sound too enthused about <laughs> that. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I do like 10 years down the road. I mean, listen, that's like a whole nother like three or four years of school. And mm -hmm. as in, I love school, but also I do enjoy one, not having to, you know, write papers and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like right now, I'm I'm TAing for one of my professors over at Seattle U mm -hmm. uh, right now. But uh I I will get my PhD in the future. It's just that like right now there's some things that I'm trying to do and work on, and I'm not sure if I have. The bandwidth for that. Is there like a standard definition of therapy? Ah, it's, see, it's tricky and it's difficult because even us in the field, it's like don't want to necessarily um, have like a formalized, formulaic, you know, description of it, right? Just because therapy can look different for a lot of people, right? There are folks who they come in, yeah, you can come in the office and just speak, right, and talk with somebody. And then there's also some folks who go on walks with their clients, right, while also still doing, having that active listening, you know, and talking with folks and stuff. I know there's some therapists who just, like, meet up in the park and they just have conversation with their clients and stuff, right? So it looks different. But I think the foremost, the core of therapy and being a therapist is being able to help folks, right, with their mental well-being, right? Helping them to identify and diagnose if there is something or specific disorders and things like that that might come up or arise just by being a human being on this planet, right? And ways of healing, right? Uh, ways of healing or helping folks do that. And Sarah Company, do you focus on therapy for men who are men of color or just black men, or can you go into that real fast? Yeah, so on my page, um, I do say that I work, work with BIPOC folks and whatnot, but I would say my case right now is almost like 90% men, right? And it's not just, you know, uh, men of color. I also have white men, too, that I work with. Um, and one of the things that I do also work with folks on is men's issues, right? Like, where is a space for us men to be able to kind of just talk about and share what it's like just being a man, right? I have folks whom talk about just the sense of a lack of purpose, for example, right? And also other folks whom they don't, doesn't really hit them until say like they're in their 30s or the 40s and they're like what have i accomplished in my life? right i have the desire to want to you know leave a legacy in some ways but there's something maybe holding me back from that or you know what are the how do you process just the stress natural stresses that come from folks who are still trying to build something or leave a legacy right or just well where's the space for you as a man to be able to just kind of talk about what it's like to be a man right societal expectations as well as your own personal goals and expectations you might have for yourself and managing the stressors that come with that. So I don't know if you're on TikTok, but it's on TikTok of a yoga, right? Mm. This lady therapist, well, I don't know if I have to run out of the right term, but this female therapist, mm -hmm. we're going to check that. She said, hey, gave me some of therapist, blah, blah. Press mm -hmm. for the men. How many of you have someone to talk to when things gone wrong or right. bad, right? Hundreds of thousand men said no one. Yep. Like, I'm a man. Who am I going to talk to? My wife, get mm -hmm. out of here. Mm -hmm. My dad, get out of here. I, I, I talk about something like, man, it was, it was so sad, right? Yep, yep. And it's real, right? Because, like, just societally, we have this expectation almost like that men don't have feelings, right? Like, we're supposed to be these stoic, you know, ice cold creatures that are able to just kind of take everything on the chin. But we're humans too, right? Regardless of how we feel about it, all human beings have emotions, right? Now, how they express and show their emotions, and also if they feel safe. To, show, to share those emotions, right? Without judgment is also important. But where do men have that? Here's one for you. And this is my opinion. It's like people are more able to like, tell their worst demons or worst stories mm -hmm. 
the same random person that's met two minutes ago versus someone that they don't know all their life. Is there a reason for that, or am I making this up? Or no, no, there, no, that's that's real, right? Because like, I think, well, one is is different telling you know something that you feel is like you know a dark secret. I don't want to say secrets, right? But sharing the things that you've been through, right, without judgment, um, with folks whom you do know, because it's hard for them not to have some sort of judgment. Right, about you and also hard for you to think that they might not have a judgment about you because like say for example you telling your mom or your parents right about things that happened to you when you were young do you think they would be able to listen to you without maybe saying well that's not what happened yeah or what are you talking about mm -hmm. we did this this and this right or they're gonna have a different complete different memory right right and it's like but when they do that it's almost like a dismissal yeah of your experience right yeah because they can't hold that space for it talking to someone who doesn't know he's like yeah that's that's crazy tell me more about that what happened right it allows you and gives you the space to be able to actually share what it is that you know you went through and how it is that you experienced it without judgment right it's validating and how many so two-part question mm -hmm. how many clients do you have right now and what's your max for clients yeah i think right now let me check like last time i checked it was gonna go i think i'm like now there's 17 or 16 clients i believe my max is 24. okay and then like i'm totally making this up please have a client right mm. i'm sure this hasn't happened yet but like so every time we're like you're with somebody three or four sessions you're like hey this this what i'm doing is not helping this person right i need to let, let them go i'm not i'm not for this person or he's not getting it like yeah. a, I'm, I'm quote unquote, taking this money for nothing right now. Yeah, no, I'll be honest. Ethically, like, I don't feel good working with somebody and it's like, this isn't working. Like, I'm just here taking their money, right? I would much rather, <laughs> I would much rather you be able to go to someone and find what it is that you're looking for, right? Because at the end of the day, it's about your healing, not my feelings or my pockets, right? I want you to get well and get better because that's what you initially came to me for. And then how long does it take you know, to figure out, okay, because obviously that person has put work in too, right? They just can't mm -hmm. show up and like tell stories. Mm -hmm. How do you figure out, or how long does it take you to feel, okay, this person is going to put the work in to get better? Is going to put the work in to get better? I think it, it depends on just how, one, reflective they are, but also how willing they are to maybe accept feedback, right? If, I mean, thankfully I haven't had you know, many clients whom they kind of come in and they're, you know, resistant towards getting some level of feedback, right? Like, you know, I'm, I'll be like, hey, well, you know, sounds like so, so this will happen. They're like, no, that's not what it is. You know, like, it's not my fault. It's always their fault, right? It's, I'm fine, right? It's always other people, right? When you have a client who deflects and is always putting the blame on other, others besides themselves or being willing to, or unwilling to be able to, like, ref reflect or self-reflect that's when it's like all right this this might be difficult or this might not be what it is that they think it is because this is for you right and how you can perhaps have different outcomes in your life and not come in here to for validation that it's everybody else's fault but me so this is totally not the same thing one time the army had a soldier that worked for me right hmm. and i think in a former period she was in six car accidents oh wow she's a never driver she's always in the back seat Hmm. I'm like, okay, now you're the common denominator, right? What, what are you like? <laughs> but so I'm not driving. Are, are you? I, I, you know, like you're uh -huh. the common denominator, right? Uh -huh. But she kept on blaming other people. I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunate. Like, but you're in six accidents in four months. Yeah. Like, I, you know, are you? Is it like that bad? Yeah. And it's like, what's well, this? Is kind of funny, but not funny. And she would say, "Hey, you know, God's protecting me." Her friend said, uh, mm -hmm. it "Seems like God's trying to kill your ass." <laughs> Like, man, I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm trying to kill you. <laughs> we do something different. I don't know if it's protected. Like, maybe you don't, don't, get, don't get in a car no more or is, something, right? Right. Try to send you a message, girl. You're just yeah. not getting this, so he's sending it again. Yeah, it's it's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So, is it a preference? Like, is it better to do, like, therapy in person versus remote or Zoom? There's a difference in that or, yeah. or therapy therapy. I'm, I'm thinking it's better to be in person personally. Yeah. And I think a lot of my clients too do prefer or if they had or if they could, right, would do in person, right? But some of them are 
30, 40 miles away from me, right? So some of them too, because they have work, you know, they have obligations as parents and things like that, right? So they can't. So I do like that we are living in an age now where therapy, you know, has so many uh, different possibilities, right, of showing up, right? People don't have to, so they say they have to drive to the therapist's office, right? They can still be where they are and still be able to access that care. But yes, there is a difference, in my personal opinion, when it comes to seeing a client in person versus um, virtual. It's because, like, I think, and even clients, some of my clients have said it too, like, they feel more comfortable right, being able to actually talk to someone face to face versus, you know, staring at a screen because they also at work, they're staring at screen. So it's like, I don't really feel like this is really that different or we can't go as deep because it's just virtual, right? We'll prefer in person. And how do you do your scheduling, right? Because I'm guessing most people work mm -hmm. a regular nine to five job that you can't take an hour off for a week to do therapy. So you like offer something like, like 5 p.m. or later, weekends, how do you work that? Well, that that's like a personal choice. Um, so for me, you know, prior to all this, yeah, I did work nine to fives, right? But I kind of found that, and it was, took a little bit of finagling, that I work best starting from like 11. So I work from like 11 all the way up to like 6.30. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm someone I prefer later on, starting later on in the day versus starting early in the morning. So it depends. Some therapists are like 8 a.m., I'm ready to go, right? I'm my first client at 8 a.m., but then I end, I'm done with the day at like, say, 2 or 3 p.m. I'm more of like the late late riser I think, or whatever it is but what if you have a client and they're like man they have like a mental breakdown or like something's really go bad are they able to like call you like i won't say 24 7 but like yeah how does that work yeah i yeah you know i tell my clients like if it's a crisis right and you know you're not sure what to do yeah sure we can we can talk about it but most likely what will happen is you know try to help folks kind of de-escalate you know, and calm down and if it's getting worse you know what i all i can do is just refer them to say you know, go to the nearest hospital, right? And they'll take care of you. Because in the hospital, they also typically have social workers who can help direct folks to say, okay, they need like a psychiatric mental health care, right? There are different clinics that are out there for specifically for you know, psychiatric uh, mental health care. So they're able to kind of decide, okay, is this a biological thing or you know, physical thing or is it like mental thing, right? And they can refer folks to the appropriate location. And like you charge by the hour, correct? Yeah, yeah. So how do you, I mean, don't tell the details, but how do you come up with your pricing model? What do you need to charge different prices? So it's stuck? Or you wouldn't have what your peers charge? Or how'd that go about, come about? Um, I mean, I think that, that depends. So when I first started off, I think I started off at like 120. Just, you know, think of what it was. And then now I'm at 140. But how that, you know, is determined is that it depends on the individual, right? One, how many hours you want to work. Um, how many days of vacation would you like? And how many clients would you like to see, right? All these different factors kind of then go into what your hourly rate will be. So I'm not gonna do the math, but if you wanna make a certain amount of money per year, okay, cool, yep. shout out to you. How many hours you wanna, how many weeks you wanna work for the year, okay? How many weeks of vacation would you like? How many clients would you like? And then that goes into determining perhaps your the price that you like to charge per client. Um. It's safe to presume you have to have get some type of malpractice insurance mm -hmm. just in case, you know, mm -hmm. something happens. Yeah, yeah, is all that, of that. Is that pretty expensive? Malpractice? <sighs> yeah, it yeah. is. Okay. Yeah, it is. But, you know, I think it's it's better to, you know, have your uh, have your butt covered than yeah. not when, if something were to happen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, is, is there, do you, you find, is, how to put this? Do you have to do like therapy differently based on like gender, demographics, male, female, economic background, or is it like you just get to the root of the problem and do therapy that way? Um, it depends, right? One thing I like about me is that I'm open minded. So I'm always trying to understand this individual and the why of them, right? And how can I communicate with them? If there's somebody whom they, you know, they respond better to like say things that are more, you know, like if I can explain to you like with the science behind something, right? Some some of my clients are like, okay, can you explain to me what anxiety actually is, right? Biological what's going on for them, right? Some people are a lot more um cognitive focused, I guess you could say, or neurotic, whatever it may be. Um they respond better to that, right? 
Whereas some other folks, it's like, you know, if we can talk about, you know, how they're feeling emotion-wise, right? We can also explore that as well, too. So one thing I just find fascinating, again, is that like, everybody's different and everybody's unique, right? And as a therapist, you get the privilege of being able to actually meet that unique individual, right? Like everybody is a story. Everybody's a whole universe. And it's like, I get to be curious about this universe and what it is that, you know, makes them tick or what it is that they respond best to. And again, it's my duty to continue to learn, right, for how I can best serve folks. And they come in and they're like, they know what's going on. It's like, well, let's talk about it. Because as we talk about it, you know, we almost always we kind of like, it reveals itself, what is going on. And it's like, oh, okay. So speaking of learning, what do you have to do to keep up date, to date with all the psychology trends and you have to get certifications yeah. every six months or how does that work? Yeah, no, we have a continuing education units or, you know, credits that you have to take, right? So don't quote me on it. I, I do know that you have to take like a uh, an ethics course every two weeks as well as, oh no, every two years, as well as a course on just like suicide, suicide prevention every two years, right? Which I believe you need about, it's like 18 or 20 credits each year, you know, to get your license renewed and stuff. So yeah, you kind of have to be on your P's and Q's when it comes to... So why have your own company versus working for some big medical corporation doing this for a big big, big company that does it? I mean, you just said it. Why would I want to work for a big <laughs> corporation? Yeah. Yeah, no. One thing I love and appreciate is the freedom that comes with being a therapist, right? Like, I get to wake up. I get to set my own times. Um, you know, I get to make my hours, basically. I get to decide how much I get paid, right? But the other side of that, too, is that everything else is on my own. Like yeah. Insurance, I have to figure out, you know, medical, dental, all that stuff to figure out, 401k, every time I have to figure it out. And also, my taxes are much higher. Um, kind of sucks. I didn't realize this. But, yeah, working for yourself, pay like 30% of everything that you make goes to, yeah. goes to Uncle Sam. But when you're working with somebody, I don't think your taxes are even that high. Yeah. I think it's like half of that or something. And are your clients, are they all like individual people? Or you, or you have like, um, we'll say, uh, making this up, ABC Tone Company, they do therapy for all their employees? Yeah, so th right now, there seems to be like this shift kind of going on in the industry, right? Where we have these EAPs, right? What they call employee assistant programs. And and that's all you did the thing with Boeing. Mm -hmm. or something, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that, and that was a workshop that I did with them. But uh, sure, even Boeing might have an EAP, right? Yeah. So what they do is they contract with other therapists, right, to be able to actually refer and send their employees to us. So, for example, I'm in the uh, Spring Health EAP as well as like Lyra. Lyra works with like Google and stuff. Spring Health works with Microsoft. So I see Microsoft clients through Spring Health. Yeah. Yeah, and then I see like some Google uh, employees through like Lyra. So. Okay. And can you practice anywhere in the United States? Or you have to be licensed in each state. Um, I no, I can only yes, you have to be licensed in each state. So right now, laugh, I shouldn't. I'm, I'm licensed in Washington and Idaho, and I I kind of giggle about the Idaho because it's like random. Like one day, I think I somebody had sent me that a link that hey, you can actually like register, you know, to be a therapist in Idaho, I think it was like 25 bucks or something, right? And often, before you get credentialed in a different state, right, they have all these different paperwork and stuff like that you have to turn in, but I just, you know, sent them a copy of my license in Washington, and I think it was like, I don't think it was like 25 bucks, 50 bucks. They're like, hi, right, congratulations, here's your license for two years. I was like, oh, okay. So, yeah, um, if you know any people in Idaho, let them know. And some guess each state, I hate to say it's a money grab, like each state has like you have to pay a certain amount of fee to get the certification and all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you have to pay. And it's like being a lawyer, I guess. Yeah. Kind of. You know, I don't know what the process is for a lawyer, but some states do have this thing called reciprocity. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you, you know, depending on which state, if they, if you have a LMHC from Washington and maybe you've had it for a certain amount of years, you can get the reciprocal full licensure in that state. Too. So, what good is going to therapy for someone? if their environments are changing, like they go to therapy, people, the people on them are still toxic, their environment is still toxic. Mm. Like they're trying to change the people around them, like still like not doing the right thing. They're not in a good environment. 
Mm-hmm. What good is going to, going to therapy for these people? Well, one, how is being that environment even impacting you? And are you aware of it? Right? It's because, yeah, you might be in a toxic environment, but, you know, it's also fair to say that that environment is also impacting you and perhaps how you respond to respond in that environment, but also when you're even outside that environment, right? Are you aware of the things that you've maybe kind of learned as a result of these being in these toxic spaces, right? Then also, what can you do to get out of said toxic environment, right? So therapy is for you, and one, having that level of self-awareness and self-reflection, learning certain tools to be able to address, you know, certain situations that you might find yourself in. And also even kind of understand, okay, what is that you can do to be in a space and to get out of this toxic space? Just because a lot of people, that toxic space becomes normalized, right? They think like that's normal. Oh, if I'm if I go home when I go home and you know, I get in a fight with like my mom, right? I yell at match or whatever. And then I go back to school like the next day, like nothing happened. Well, one, that's not true because that something did happen. Like that interaction that you have with your mom might have an impact on even how you are in your relationships, right? Outside of your family. Two, how do you perceive yourself as an individual, right? As you walk about, are you worthy of love? If every day you go home, it's always a fight, right? Are you aware of like how being in this situation is even having an impact on you biologically, right? Just like stress-wise, your stress response and things like that. So whatever happens in your environment, you also take with you and it leaves an impression on you when you go into a different environment. And how can you, one, be aware of what's happening and two, be able to like heal and do things differently? Okay. And so um, I think it's Gen Z. I think Gen Z gets a lot of crap for all the stuff they do. Sure. But I think to get a, one thing to do right is like mental health days, right? Maybe yeah. kind of this. However, I think some of the generation take it too far, right? Like you can't do mental health every day, right? I think there's goodness like kind of like building resiliency. Yeah. Like, you know, failing, doing the stuff. So how do you recommend people like balance, like taking care of the mental health first and also like, you know, being mentally strong at the same time? Yeah. I mean, I think one you don't need to pathologize every human behavior right or every human experience that you have two mental a mental disorder is almost like an extreme form of everyday experience right every, like it's normal to maybe feel anxious when you are say you're about to take a test or you have a test coming up right it's abnormal if you're nervous about everything right like before you cross the street you're nervous right when you wake up you're nervous that you know, something might, something bad might happen, or right? That's what we call an anxiety disorder. So, being aware of what is just normal, right? Normal responses to everyday situations, and what might be maybe abnormal responses. First, and two, the idea is that you know, I as a therapist, I don't want you to be coming to therapy eight, nine years, right? And we're still talking about the same thing. I want you to come in, be able to learn the tools. Right. And feel, you know, resilient enough that, you know, when we're done, when you go out to the world, you're able to respond different. Right. Like, even though you might be anxious about something, you can still be able to self-soothe and still be able to move forward. Right. Anxiety is just your mind maybe trying to make you aware of something, trying to protect you from something. Right. But you can say, OK, thank you for the, you know, the message. Right. But I'm OK. I'm going to keep on going. Right. And as more you do that, as you are able to move forward the anxiety alarm kind of goes down because like it signals, and I'm just speaking in very layman's terms, right? It's like signals to your subconscious, like, oh, okay, guys, like, you know, we're fine. We're not in danger. We're good, right? That's how we're supposed to move forward. In this. Is there goodness in people doing group therapy? Yeah, yeah. Being in a group space definitely helps to validate your experience, right? So it doesn't feel like you know, you're alone. Like, take, for example, you know, AA. A meetings and what they're for and how they help folks. <clears throat> it kind of help. It helps folks to kind of recognize that this issue that they're having that it's not just them, that it's not that they're not alone. That there are other people who have gone through something similar, right? And they can even also share what was helpful for them when they were in a similar situation that you might find yourself in right now. So, yes, group therapy is definitely helpful because it's validation. So some of the things you help people with is imposter syndrome for BIPAC professionals, mm-hmm. the total racism, microaggressions, mm-hmm. 
managing anxiety or stress and managing burnout. Mm-hmm. Have you found there's this one like people like are really like struggling with as a whole? Like you're like if you could, if you could like if you had the money and resources to focus on this one item out of those, you would like focus on one and make make mm. yeah out of those yeah. that you just said. I think one that keeps coming up these days is imposter syndrome. I think, and maybe this is just because of the clients that I do see, right? Folks who work in tech, whatnot. But oftentimes, because it's folks who you know come from a minority background, right? Folks of color and stuff. This, there maybe this might be the, some for some of them. It's the first time where you know they're in a position where they're making like six figures, right? Um. They're in a team working for a multi-billion dollar companies and whatnot, right? And they're doing these projects and whatnot. But there's still that sense of uh, just doubt, self-doubt, right? Because I've never seen this before. And it's like, it, there's a creep of self-doubt of, do I actually know what I'm doing? Do I actually belong here? Because one, I might be the, I'm the first one in my family to do this and I can't mess up, right? And what if I do mess up, right? Which never will be all, at all our jobs. We might make a mistake. Does this mean that, oh, does it validate the thought that I had that I don't know what I'm doing or I don't belong here? So imposter syndrome is one that I feel creeps up for a lot of folks, right? That questioning and self-doubt of whether I belong in the position that I'm in right now and if I know what I'm doing. And also, you know, I don't want to be seen as a fraud or for people to kind of catch me being a fraud. So how do I avoid being a fraud? So how do you help people overcome that? Because like it's it's a real deal for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I think one kind of unpacking understanding where the self doubt comes from, right? Oftentimes it comes from childhood. What was your experience when it came to say praise, right? Were you only praised when you did good things, and when you did like when you met a certain expectation, yeah. but then when you didn't? Were you then like severely criticized? I remember reading the stats about that where the kids got praised more often, went on like have higher house self esteem. Mm-hmm. People were like, "Hey, you piece of crap, what's wrong with you?" Then you know, obviously mm-hmm. they're like lower self esteem and mm-hmm. self doubt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. all of that, right? So it's like, what happens when you make a mistake? Right? Are you able to say, "Oh, you know, I made a mistake this time, but you know, next time I'm gonna do it different," right? Mm-hmm. Or at least I know now what I need to improve myself on, right? What we call a growth mentality. Or when you made a mistake, was it seen as, well, here's another affirmation that I don't know what I'm doing or I'm, I'm dumb or I'm really, you know, stupid, right? Again, that's where that low self-esteem comes from. That's the difference between someone who grows up with a high self-esteem, someone who grows up with a low self-esteem and how they interpret or make sense of a mistake. So I think this is my best example, maybe worst example of like Pasta Syndrome. Mm-hmm. You know who Suni Lee is, the Olympic gymnastics person? No, no. So everyone knows who Simone Biles is. Simone yeah. Biles, the GOAT gymnastic, right? Mm-hmm. Won everything 2016. 2020, she got the twisties, mental health issues since so she dropped out. Mm-hmm. Suna Lee was the um, person who won overall Olympic gold medal for the United States. I mean, for the Olympics, right? Nice. Well, she later laid it out that she didn't think she deserved it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, how, there's no way I should have won this. If someone both would have been here, I would have won. But like, well, she wasn't there. You did win. You are the overall Olympic gold medalist. I'm thinking like, if she has it, like what chance did anyone else, right? You know, she has right. an Olympic gold medal, the best that she does in the world. Yo. And she's still like, I don't deserve this. Mm-hmm. And like, mm-hmm. like, damn. When I saw that story, that really hit it for me. Like, man, if she's struggling, like, man. Mm-hmm. No, it's real. It's real, right? Because it's like, you, is she comparing herself to Simone Biles, right? Does it feel like you know, excellence is only Simone Biles. Yeah, I feel like if she would have been there, I would have got silver and I even medal, right? Right. But she wasn't there. You did win the gold medal. Like, right. you did beat everyone else. Mm-hmm. You did, and that's definitely worthy of recognition and praise for her, right? But she's having a hard time even internalizing for you. Yeah. For real. That's crazy. Um, so pre-talk, you're talking about you doing some kind of webinar or live event coming up? Yeah, yeah. So I did it actually last month. So it was a, it's called the We Mind We Matter Networking Mixer. And what I do, and this is also one thing that you know, was a bit of a call a passion project of mine, right? Is that one shout out to mental health. You know, it's blowing up now. It's definitely got a lot more recognition, and everything. Um, but I think a lot of folks too, when they are looking and ready for you know a therapist. 
have a hard time even like knowing where they can find a therapist, specifically a therapist of color. And what We Mind, We Matter is about is trying to connect folks in the community who are looking for therapists of color, right? And that's definitely one of my passions, right? Especially being myself a black male therapist. I didn't realize this, but apparently I'm a unicorn. Like a black male therapist is something that's like almost like a, I have to look at the percentage, but even for you know, overall, when it comes to the therapy field, right, the percentage of black therapists is only is only four percent, and majority of that are black women. When it comes to black men, I think it's even I have to look at the stat, but I'm like percentage of a percentage basically, and that was mind blowing to me because I thought, oh, there there must be more of me, right, like. Even though I didn't see a lot of people in my cohort that look like me, I mean, hey, I mean, I've, there are black men out there. I'm sure if I'm thinking about therapy and psychology, there are also black men that also think about therapy and psychology. But no, there isn't. So one of my goals is to try to help folks who are seeking a therapist of color be able to actually find them. And we did, we did a, the We Mind Me Mind Network and Mixer last month over at the station coffee shop in Columbia City. and we had a panel discussion, one with a professor from UW about BIPOC mental health and some of the stigmas in there. But we also had therapists there, therapists of color, whom, you know, if folks were looking for a therapist, they could connect and network and meet one. All right, so we have folks in the community come in, had the discussion, and then we had this, you know, networking where folks could meet other therapists of color. So that's something that uh, I've been doing uh, for, for a bit. It started off with actually just connecting therapists, first and foremost, of color to like network within themselves. And then this last few events, we opened it up to public to kind of come and actually meet some of these therapists. And the next time I think we'll be doing that will probably be sometime in November just because we've got you know, some other things. This time we want to try to organize it and make it even bigger, right? And have folks actually kind of come in and, you know, we'll have a longer time. So the big one, again, will be in November. Are you going to do the same location? Uh, to be decided, possibly, okay. possibly, okay. but yeah, for now. Yeah, I'm guessing it'd be unethical for you to like be or some bar drinking beer and, and talk to you, tell some random person. Do you have any psychological? Right. Like, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in my car. I'm in my therapist when we're taking tequila shots. I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, um, probably be at a coffee shop. Um, I mean, I think it'll be alcohol, but actually, no, never mind. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it'll be a coffee. Is shop. there? Um, age that it's too young to get therapy. Too young to get therapy. Yep. Mm. Like should somebody eight years old or six years old been going through therapy? No, I mean there are like you know child therapists, right? And they're also you know prenatal therapists. Well, not not prenatal. Um, folks who work with you know babies who are nonverbal and things like that. But oftentimes at that age, what these therapists typically do is that they actually work with the parents, mm -hmm. right? Because Again, a child is this, you know, human being that's just responding to their environment. And the the biggest influencer in said environment is the parent. So how can you, as a therapist, I mean, as a parent, create a space where your child can feel safe, you know, and feel as if you are there to be able to protect them? Because when children, specifically babies, children, are, babies are very, very perceptive. They have a very strong sense of, if they're safe or they're not safe. Right? And that's why they cry. They cry because they're like, I don't feel safe. I need attention right now because I will die if I don't, if I'm not tended to. Right? So how can you as a parent tend to the cries of your baby, right? To notice you know, what is this going on for them. Because when they cry, when a child cries and you tend to them, it sends you know, back reinforcement that, okay, I have someone here who can protect me. Right? But when they keep on crying, nobody is there to protect them. Eventually, they will stop crying, right? But that's because they've realized that no matter how much I cry and ask for help, nobody's coming. And now how does this then translate when this baby becomes older in terms of relationships, right? They learn from a young age that nobody's coming to save me. I can't rely on anybody, right? And that's what now there's these people with attachment and whatnot. The relationship and attachment that you have in at a much older age, typically begin from the relationship you have with your parents. And then, can you be too old to do therapy? Nah. 
regardless, 80, 60, 70. I mean, when you're ready, you're ready, man. Like, you can be 80 and be like, you know what? I, I've i had quite the life, and I feel like I need somebody. I need to talk to somebody about everything that I've just been through and experienced. Like, yeah. Has this happened to you yet where, like, you have a client, and you work on the client, and then, like, you just have a breakthrough, and it's like, okay. I want to say, like, the person is cured or healed, but you're like, okay, we've, like, we've had this major breakthrough, and, like, you're going to be better with your life. Has that happened yet? <laughs> well, so typically how it goes is I can't say, like, yeah, I cured you. Now you're fine. Things get better for folks, right, when after, after a certain period in therapy. They feel like they're not as depressed or down. They have a clearer sense of the things that are happening to them, right? Like, the awareness, like, oh, okay, so, you know, when I go here, when this person said this, this to me, that's why I feel so down. And I'm not, I now know why it is that I felt, felt down. So things progressively tend to get better. And then, you know, when they're like, okay, I don't feel as, you know, perhaps depressed, or I feel like I have the tools now, right? Like, you know, last time, when I was talking to her, for example, right, I instead of like blowing up, I used like an I statement. I said, I feel frustrated when you do this because blah, 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 right? That's a different way of communicating. And that led to a different outcome. And I have these tools to be able to better communicate how it is I'm feeling versus for this if I always have to yell or I have to like hold a bottle of everything inside, right? So things get progressively better for folks. And they're like, you know what, Kelvin? You know, my life isn't perfect, but I think I can manage it okay. Yes, that's, I'm happy for you. I love that for you. That's what I want, I love to hear, that you feel like you have, you're resilient now to be able to kind of uh, respond to these same situations, right, in a different way. So, yeah, you know, kudos to you. Off you go, and if and when, you know, perhaps you feel like you want to come back, maybe, like, you know, get a refresher, maybe strengthen some things, or, you know, talk about something more, if you have more questions, stuff, you come in, but... Folks recognize that, no, things haven't completely changed, but I feel like I have the tools and strength to be able to respond. How about when, like, you do a therapy with someone mm -hmm. and, like, they're still struggling and they say, hey, you know what, I, I can't do this anymore. Do mm -hmm. you, like, hey, do you kind of try to influence, hey, you, you're making progress, you, gotta, you should keep on going and doing it, or, like, do you follow up from, like, a month later, hey, are you ready to come back? Like, you know in your heart, your mind, like, hey, this guy needs therapy, right? Or this person needs therapy, but that, I don't want to do it no more. How does that work? Yeah, sometimes some people may not be there yet, right? They might not be ready because, again, therapy is about you and what it is that you need and what it is that you're looking for. And if you feel like maybe you're not in a place right now, right, naturally, one, it would be harmful for me to force you to do something you don't want to do, right? Because, like, change, I can't make you change. You have to be the one that kind of recognizes what's going on and recognize, okay, I need to do something different, right? I can say, like, I've had sessions where, you know, I've said something to somebody like three or four times in the past, right? And then a few weeks later, they come back like, Kelvin, like, today I did this. I mean, I just realized, blah, blah, you know, I just I just realized that I had, I'd be doing this. And I'm like, I told you that two months ago, bro. So it was like, they weren't ready to actually, like, receive that, right? Until maybe they went through it and came to their own realization for it and i'm just like okay and now let's explore more of that like why do you think this happened right so you're ready when you're ready as far as ethics do you have to make sure like you say you have like 10 clients i think what do you mean like you have like like 10 clients right now i was like 16 or 17. 16 mm -hmm. do you have to make sure like these clients don't know each other um i mean oh yeah yeah i think i know what you're asking yeah, yeah. um yeah, for the sake of uh, what's that called conflict of interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes I don't know. That, yeah, obviously, you know. yeah, yeah. But if I do find that you know they they do know each other, I mean, I would hope that they don't talk to each other. Yeah, yeah, obviously, it. but yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, speaking of generalities, it's like most people are either positive or they're negative, right? Hmm. Is that from genetics, environment? And can somebody be positive, become negative, and vice versa? What do you mean by positive? Like a negative? positive outlook on life. Like they wake, mm -hmm. they wake in the morning. I'm a Caesar day. Mm -hmm. The universe is my oyster. Yeah, yeah. Negative, like the whole world's against me. Whatever I do, I'm gonna fail at it. You know, 
mm-hmm. even though they're successful in life, right? You know, mm-hmm. I think that's like genetics, environment, just a combination of things. Yeah. So, man, that whole like environment versus genetics debate and stuff, right? And I think we've just come to the conclusion research, right, has shown that it is a mix of both, right? Environment as well as bio. Um, some people, you know, or might be predisposed to have a certain, uh, there's some folks that are predisposed maybe to have depression because right? it runs in the family, quote unquote. But if you are in a different environment, right, it's less likely that said uh, depression gene, I don't know if you want to call it that, but it is, um, it will actually manifest itself. So the environment also plays a role in how your genetics also you know, uh, reveal themselves or show themselves. So, yeah, life, Every that's what I said. Every individual is unique because you can't say that, oh, this person, because they come from this, they have these genes or whatever in their family, that they're going to end up this way. Well, the environment that they're in also plays a role in how, you know, these genes kind of manifest and show up for themselves. And the individual, too, can say, yeah, I might be having, you know, anxious thoughts, but I'm okay. Right, it might be you no. Know, that might be like their predisposition for anxiety, maybe showing up, but they can still respond different. So, two part question: sure. When should someone like start reaching out to get therapy? Is it something that'll let us know eternally? And then, how do they go about finding the right therapist for them for themselves? Yeah, man. So, when it comes to therapy, sometimes you know, some people they know they know. It's like I know that. You know, I've had this issue or this problem for quite a long time, and some people might say, I need to talk to someone about it, right, to kind of help me make sense of what it is that I'm experiencing or going through. And then for other folks, it's like, if you find yourself still kind of repeating certain patterns, right, certain patterns that are unhelpful to you, right, or unhealthy, um, but you still don't know why, but you find yourself just in these situations responding this way, right, and yeah, I might recommend maybe talking to someone to kind of help unpack, maybe make sense of why some things are happening, right? Just because, one, as human beings, we can't see ourselves, right? Only other people can see. Like, you can only see yourself through a mirror. You, if you were like, you know, in the jungle somewhere, you wouldn't be able to see yourself, right? And that's the strange beauty of humanity is that we all actually need each other, right? So being able to talk to someone who can reflect back to you, like, you know, you can say, hey, this is my norm, and I went this, and it was like, hold on, pause. I noticed that this time you took a different bus than you did last time. What's up with that? Let's talk about that, right? For you, it's normal, but somebody's like, I know that's different. What's, what, what's going on there, right? So talking with somebody in a non-judgmental space right, is helpful to kind of help unpack and see what we actually see there. So we should write to someone that say they're – freshman, sophomore in college, and they're interested in, like, doing this as a career, hmm. what would be your advice to this person? Yeah, well, one, I would say, you know, what's your why? Like, you know, why do you want to go down this path? And two, if you do, you know, know your why, and it's because, you know, you genuinely care about people and you want to help people, I would say do your research into what it is about psychology that makes you tick, right? Because some people are more prone to, yeah, my life, my like psychology, but they might actually like the research side of things, right? Like unpacking the why and how that things work. And the other side of that is people who want to help, right? Use the research that folks like, you know, folks like you might, you know, come up with or discover to be able to actually help clients. Just because I had, I've known some people whom they went to school, right, for therapy, got their master's in social work, counseling, what have you. But then they just didn't do it because they're like, after one year, they're like, all right, the same for me. So like, I don't have the bandwidth. The, the patience. I and don't have the patience. The listening skills. Yep. Yep. Because it's like. I want to be the one talking all the time. <laughs> mm, right. Right. It's like, okay. Well, then maybe, yeah, we picked the wrong reason for getting <laughs> in here, right? Can you actually be quiet for like 50 minutes and just listen, right? And also be able to like not judge people um, even when they might say something you might not personally agree with, right? Like, can you hold yourself back? Right. Because again. It's not even about you. It's about this person and the healing that they need. And do you genuinely care about them? So let's say um, you're doing a session with someone. It's an hour session. Sure. And you're at the 57-minute mark. 
And then like, you can tell, okay, this guy's about to really like indulge some really good stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, how does that work? You like take notes and say, hey, let's go back to this, this point where we come back. You like go over the hour. How does that work? Yeah. And I, and I mean, I think that's what we call, you know, using like your clinical judgment. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I've had some clients who I couldn't like, we're at the 50 minute mark, whatever, but ethically it would be wrong for me to kind of just end it because for so long, you know, we kind of took us a while, but we got to maybe, you know, what the, what the crux, mm -hmm. the crux or we know what the issue perhaps might be. And let's touch on that because if I were to be like, oh, well, I know we just discovered, you know, why it is that, you know, what's going on here. Yeah, next week. Right. And I see you're crying, but uh, I got to go. Yeah. Right. That's, that's not okay. So okay. It depends. Okay. Now, I don't know on your website, you have a slotting <laughs> fee for people can afford stuff, right? Mm -hmm. My question is that is like, how do you verify that they really can't afford it, right? Because of mm -hmm. course, there's a lot of people like, you know, like scoopless people out there, right? Who take yeah. advantage of that. So how do you make sure, okay, this person really is struggling, struggling economically? Mm -hmm. Or is this honor system? Honor system. Man. Okay. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I hope that, you okay. know, yeah, you just be honorable and do the right thing. Okay. All right. Um, so change subject real fast. Sure. Talk about some of your hobbies and stuff you do for fun. Yeah, some of my hobbies. Um, I like so the summer. I haven't done it this year, but usually in the summer, um, I'll usually go out. So I I do drumming, mm -hmm. like djembe drumming and stuff. Um, I really enjoy that. I also really enjoyed like learning music and stuff. Like right now, I'm like learning piano stuff, which is pretty fun. Um. I also just like to be out and about, man. Like, Seattle is very beautiful. Like, I'm I have a joke. When Seattle's nice, it's nice. But when it's not, it's fucking not. Bruh. <laughs> Listen, this was, winter was tough, man. Like, winters are tough when out I got, here. Like, like, when people move, like, in October, November, December, January, like, man. Yeah. Like, more power to you. Listen. More power to you. I don't know how you could, how you, how you could do that. Like, that's wild. I, but I do know some people are like, yeah, I, I love the rain. I'm like. Yeah. You're crazy. Yeah. But yeah, especially now, right? So I love going out and just being in the sun. Mm -hmm. I love seeing the green, right? It definitely, yeah. you know, fills me with joy. Um, but also I also like to go out and explore like different restaurants, different mm -hmm. bars and stuff as well yeah. too. So yeah, I just like to be out and about, just explore. So that's a totally random question. Yeah, what's up? Is this such a thing as Ghanaian food? And yeah. What, and what what is that? What is it? Man, so Ghanaian food is a lot of different things. I can't necessarily pinpoint it. But one of my friends opened up a restaurant, actually, that serves Ghanaian food. So if anybody's interested, check out Gold Coast Gal Kitchen up in uh, First Hill. Um, She has... Gold Coast Gal? Gold Coast Gal. So, like, Gold Coast and then Gal, she spelled it. Like, this says in First Hill? Where's that at? Yeah, so it's like... Uh, where, where the hospital is that? Okay. Like around that area. Okay. Up on uh which hospital? Is that Virginia Mason or something? Up uh it's by close by Seattle U. By by Burian. Okay. Stuff. Yeah. So Ghanaian food, yeah, it's a lot of different stuff just because Ghana Ghana has a lot of different ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. And in that little ethnic groups they bring all like their different foods and culinaries mm -hmm. and things like that. So my favorite is Wache. Okay. Wache is like like this brown, brownish rice with uh with beans in it. Got a delicious stew, macaroni, and some like grit. Yeah. Anyway, I gotta go close. Yeah, I'll get some of that. Okay. Get the watch on. So next, yeah. and this is something you, if you don't want to talk about, I don't have to, right? Mm -hmm. But what's your take on psychedelics for mental health, like LSD, magic mushrooms, edibles, those kind of things? Man, you're gonna make me go controversial here. So I, so before you say that, right? Mm. I've said this in podcasts before. Like I, I think speak of all veterans, but I say ninety eight percent of the veterans I know do one of those things from their house, right? Mm -hmm. And then people don't realize, like in the state of Texas, like conservative all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. The state of Texas, they give like I make I make this number up, like twenty million dollars per year to the VA system in mm. the state of Texas to for psychedelic research, right? Oh. And then there's a governor, ex governor Rick Perry, right? Mm. Like the current governor. Uh, Greg Abbott is really conservative. Mm -hmm. Rick Perry makes him look like a liberal, right? And Rick Perry is like all in on psychedelics, mm. which is kind of amazing, right? So people on both sides of the political chamber is like, 
mm-hmm. doing like psychedelics. Of course, Joe Rogan is a big person on it. Different yeah. people like really all in psychedelics. Yeah. So it's funny you take on that because I think some people are like, okay, psychedelics is still illegal. I can't mess with it, you know, sure. all that kind of stuff, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I'm I'm for it, right? Just because one, there is a lot of there's a lot about you know the human psyche that we're still unpacking and discovering. Um, it's interesting because I'm not sure a lot of people really notice know this, but there is a reason why you get high when you actually smoke the marijuana plant. It's because your brain naturally has receptors for the marijuana plant, right? They're what we call endocannabinoids, meaning your your brain automatically it already makes neurotransmitters that are similar to, you know, the uh, the chemicals in marijuana. So sometimes they call like the run is high, right? That's real. You know, you kind of get a slight buzz high off of uh, running. So naturally, our minds are already kind of like uh, primed to actually work and you know accept these chemicals and these, I want to say chemicals, these uh these medicines and whatnot. And also, other Asian cultures used to do them, right? It was a reason why they did that, because it was like a mind-altering, you know, experience, and it did have an impact. Like, LSD, mushrooms, um, they do have an impact on you mentally, right? And how you even process trauma, right? So, they are all forms of medicine, right? Um, some folks might feel some type of way about it, but that's the truth. They are medicine, and... You have to also remember, like, we are also a part of nature, right? Like, we have things in that, things in common with plants, right? Plants have things in common with us. Plants breathe, we breathe, right? You have a network there where they connect and communicate and talk with each other. We do as well. We created, you know, language and things like that, right? So, no, I'm all, I'm all for it. Yeah, I just know so many veterans were like, you know, the veteran VA system, they do the best they can, right? Yeah. Prescribe, like, you know, we call the normal legal medicines. Sure. Nothing happened, and they go on their own, like, an experiment, so to speak, and they're like, mm-hmm. so much better, right? I mean, yeah, like, I, all, it, it can't all be a coincidence. Well, you can say that, but so I, full disclosure, yes, I've done mushrooms before, and even then I was like, I see what's happening here, mm-hmm. right? Mushrooms kind of like, just releases everything from you, right? So some of the things that maybe you might have been repressing, right, unconscious and whatnot, it's all just, like, lifted off and just revealed to you. Now you have no choice. Kind of going back to, you know, the conversation we had about EMDR and processing, right? You're forced to process this experience that you just had. It's, like, right in your face, and it's, like, almost like you're watching a movie and it's passing you by, and you're like, oh, this is actually, so, so this is something that happened to me. It's not something that's happening to me right now. Right, allows your brain the capacity to be able to actually like make sense of what just happened and process it. And even after you come down, you know, even after you come down, right, you're you're left with what just happened. You actually went through quote unquote an experience mm-hmm. where you, you know, it might it might have taken you maybe months or years in talk therapy, but you just had this experience in like two or three hours. Yeah, I think it was a shame. Is like all this stuff is like schedule one drugs, whatever. Yeah, and I'm sure that like, keeps like. Federal funding for research, all that kind of stuff be done, right? So, sure. yeah, it's not a good thing. Yeah, I mean, you also have to remember, right? Like, these categorizations were made by human beings, yeah, right? And they have their opinion about you know, these uh, these medicines. Yeah, the people's like opinion is that people are the opinion because they actually tried it and got experimented with it, or just, or just like, oh, this the granddaddy's told them it was bad or whatever, you right? Know? Right, and now somehow it's illegal. So, yeah, cool. Um, so can you talk some, like, more detail, like, how your business got started, what you focus mm-hmm. on now, what your plan is for your business moving forward? Yeah, so I, so after I graduated from Seattle U, I worked in a, you know, a bunch of different places, right? So first I was working with this, this community mental health agency that did work with high schoolers, right, in alternative high schools. So we will go in, and I think at one point we were, doing a uh, a group pretty much it was like a group therapy class right it's called the emotional wellness class but we would do that you know the first hour of the school you know the kids would kind of come in and we'll talk about just mental health reflecting on you know how the week has been so far for them and everything like that then also we we'll see some of the kids on a one-on-one basis as well too and then after that we well i don't know if we 
after that, I went to work at Fairfax for a little bit. Fairfax is a psychiatric hospital over in uh, Kirkland. Did that for a little bit. And then afterwards, I worked with an agency that contracted with CPS to do like in-home family therapy. So these weren't families that, you know, CPS really deemed like removal was necessary, but maybe they might need you know, like just some family therapy, right? And parents kind of understanding how to actually communicate and talk with their kids. And also we connected them to like different resources, right, in the community. So, you know, your DHS, you know, connecting with, with uh, you know, food stamps, you know, if they needed it, right, those types of resources. So we did that for a little bit and it was very, you know, rewarding work, but it didn't pay as much. So then afterwards I transitioned into private practice in 2019 and, you know, kind of been doing that ever since. But one of the things I would like to do now is transition to do more workshops, right? You know, do more workshops on just this thing called imposter syndrome, for example, right? Helping folks kind of understand it, and specifically for BIPOC folks, is because our experiences of you know, imposter syndrome is fairly different, right? One, being, say, the only black person in the room, right? Can send subtle messages and questions of, like, self-doubt, like, do you actually belong here? Because you don't see other people that look like you. And that's not necessarily something that, you know, is your fault, right? Just because evolutionary speaking, you know, we kind of evolved with the idea of, like, understanding where we belong and where we don't belong, right? For matters of safety, right? So if you see other folks that may say may not look like you, right, your mind sends you a message like, yo, you know, just be careful, right? Do you actually know where you are? Right? Do you, like, do you actually belong here, right? For matters of safety. But in this situation, you're not in any danger, right? And as a person of color, just reminding and remembering that, oh, this feeling I'm having, this is where it's coming from. But it doesn't mean that I don't belong. Because, heck, I was hired because maybe I'm the only guy who knows how to program the color orange in this project or something, right? And that's um, something kind of cool. It doesn't have anything to do with your skin color, right? It's just about your expertise and you do belong in this space. So helping folks of color kind of, one, understand what's going on for them, right? And also just what are the tools and ways to maybe reframe certain things. So workshop, and then also one of the things, too, that I'm trying to do as well is kind of be the bridge that connects, you know, folks of color who are looking for other therapists of color, right? Hence the We Mind, We Matter event mm -hmm. and trying to kind of bring folks together. Is there some kind of ethical thing where if you're a therapist, you have to give some amount of time for pro bono work or is this just individual decision? I think it's an, it's an individual okay. decision, yeah. Folks want to, they can. If they don't want to, they also can. So, yeah. And so go back when you first started your business. Mm. Talk through, like, I'm presuming it's kind of difficult to find your first client because you're new to therapists. Mm. Can you just talk about how you find your first clients and, like, advice to people in the same situation now trying to find their first clients? Yeah. Well, I think networking. Is definitely important, right? Um, you know, if there are, say, so when I first started, I networked with, like, hospitals, right? And also, I know with different organizations that work with maybe some of the uh, populations that I would like to work with, right? So, you know, I like to work with black folks. So when I first started, I networked with, like, different organizations that work with, you know, either folks of color or, you know, black folks in particular, right? Kind of important to get your name out there, right? So people do know who you are. And also, what are the things that you do, you know, specifically work with folks with, right? Finding your niche. Just because I think as therapists, we oftentimes, you know, believe that we're supposed to be able to work with anybody, right? Kind of we're supposed to be what we call a generalist. Well, that's not necessarily the case, nor is that really helpful because you can't fix everybody, right? Like, for example, I don't necessarily work with folks, you know, specifically on eating disorders, right? Because I don't know too much about eating disorders and it's not really something that I can necessarily relate with, but also levels of comfortability. Right? So let's say finding your niche, what it is that you want to work with, work on, uh, work with people with, and also the population. And also, yeah, networking, you know, joining Facebook groups for therapists, for example, um, you know, trying to do workshops, right? Whatever you can to kind of get your name out there. And also, Join different directories. So Psychology Today, one big directory. There's Therapy Den, and well as other different directories for therapists out there too. 
So I know like LinkedIn is like good for like job searchers and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Is there like a, like for HR, a lot of HR people go to Twitter. Is there, is there like a, 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 a social media that a lot of therapists hang out on? Uh, <laughs> Facebook. Facebook, okay. Yeah, there's different like Facebook groups. Facebook groups, stuff, okay. Yeah, specifically for therapists where, you know, we send each, can say, hey, I'm looking for somebody who works with, Okay. on this issue you know this kind of stuff so yeah so i know i'm gonna ask this next question incorrectly but is there a case or is there is, is there a situation where like let's suppose i'll put this let's suppose someone's suicidal right mm-hmm. and they've made up their mind i'm gonna you know i'm gonna do the deed mm-hmm. is, is there a point where like they like they made a plan that i'm gonna do this is there a time point where like they can't be talked out of it like someone has a mind to, i'm doing this mm-hmm. like no matter no matter who talks to them what Resource they do like their mind they're gonna do this right yeah um or can they still be talked out of it so to speak you say I ask like if I as a therapist can like talk somebody down or a therapist yeah. or any any yeah or they like I hate to use a, I hate to use a firm like too far gone but like they like I'm doing this Tuesday eight in the morning I'm I'm doing this right I mean so if I hear that right again as a mandated reporter I have you got to tell someone okay I have to tell someone okay all right yeah. okay just because okay. like. Yeah, they can't harm themselves. But like, if someone's decided, like, "Hey, I'm doing this," is it, I mean, you, can you really stop them? Right? Like, besides putting them twenty four seven walks, putting them in a jail cell, having a battle buddy, like, I mean, not, like, army. A lot of time, people say they're gonna like, do harm themselves. You gotta mm-hmm. put like a battle buddy with them twenty four seven, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, hence why you call somebody, right? Mm-hmm. And even if you know, maybe they're taken to like you know, isolation, um, involuntary detained is what we call it. Um, when you know, they're sent to like a psychiatric unit and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, they can still say, yo, the minute I get out of here, I'm going to do it. Yeah. Right. It's like. And you I, keep them in the detainee cell like the rest of their lives? I mean, well, that's. Maybe you do. I, I can't say. I, I don't know what the laws are yeah. with that. Right. But I think if they are still trying to, you know, making claims to harm themselves, it wouldn't necessarily be safe to let them out. But again, don't, don't call me on yeah. that. I'm yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. Them, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so we both live in Seattle. Obviously, Seattle has like mental health issues, homeless issues, drug issues. Yeah. And like we talk pre-talk, like I tell people all the time, people waste more than me, way more money than me, have themselves so solved it, right? And sure. I and I tell you some of the stories of like instances here, like last couple months, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, people say we just can't take these people, like lock them up in the institution, right? But yeah. But I mean, plain devil's like an advocate. Why not, right? Maybe that's what they need, right? Because people say, well, no. It's not their choice, but if they're in the state, do they really have a choice anyway, right? Yeah. Well, see, and, and this one is, it is tricky. Yeah, it's right? very tricky, yeah. Very tricky and controversial because, one, we don't know the past of this person, mm-hmm. right? Like, so for example, one of the most common ways that folks end up becoming addicted to drugs is actually through prescription medication. Yeah, I've heard that. Right. Yeah. So folks who say might be prescribed for like pain medication, right? Like, you know, what is it called? What's that? Oxycodone, Oxycodone, all of that, right? Those are very easily addictive drugs, right? Once you're cut off, you can have withdrawals. And one of the ways to be able to actually address those withdrawals is through drugs like heroin, right? Or even like methamphetamine, what have you, right? And going down that path, right? Next thing you know, you're you've sold everything that you own, and it happens. It can happen fast, right? Exactly. Yep. So it's like, well, this person didn't necessarily choose this situation, right? It was once upon a time they were prescribed the medication by what they deemed as a trusted medical professional, and now they've developed an addiction. And how do you kind of help folks with that? And also, the tricky thing about addiction is that folks have to be willing and open, actually. To receive help, yeah, because you can't help somebody who doesn't want to help. Yeah, I think the unfortunate thing in Seattle, I think a lot of us are just desens- desensitized, right? Yeah, we see it every day. Yeah. I mean, it's like it is nothing changing. Mm. Like with me, like when I was in the army, I got hurt really bad one time. Mm. They made me bike it in, right? Mm. Yeah, I uh, like I can never take this again. Mm-hmm. It was like this. If I take this again, I'm be addicted. It, it was like I was, I was so wonderful. It's like the greatest yeah, in the world. I like felt that, huh? Yeah, I felt it. Like man, and look how I was smart enough. Like yeah, I can't fuck with this no more, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was like yeah, it was next level, right? Yeah, and you know, it was, and the crazy part too is, you know, America is a very stressful place, mm-hmm. 
very stressful country. How great would it be if you could just pop a pill and it just make you forget all about it? Hey, Biken, it was that for me. Listen, <laughs> it was that for me, yo. Uh huh. See, so it's like, I'm like, damn, I know what Eminem's talking about now. Mm hmm. No, so it's like, dang, like, yeah, what do we do? Because at, at some point, you really like, yeah, I'm blame folks because it's like, life is stressful, man. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if I take a pill or, you know, you know, take a little injection or a shot mm -hmm. that'll make me forget all my worries. Happy go lucky, but then you're not really experiencing life, are you? There you go. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you're now homeless on the sidewalk, right? And still having withdrawals and, you know, very kind of eager for the next hit, basically. Yeah. So, Calvin, is there anything else that I asked you that I haven't or anything else you want to talk about? Um, well, I think, you know, what's it like for therapy for folks of color? I think that's something that's always fairly, fairly interesting. Um, I'll be honest, it, I was a bit surprised when I saw how many folks reach out, especially for therapy, specifically folks of color. But also a lot of people who kept saying, I, for one, I did not know where to go to find a therapist. Right. Because I assume that everybody knew about psychology today and right, what it is. But a lot of people come to find out actually don't know where to find a therapist. Like, I asked a friend, like, yo, like, you know, if you had to find a therapist with somebody, you know, where would you go? You know, like, no, I'm, I, I would ask you. What do you mean? Like, I'm, I'm, I don't know all the therapists in the States. Like, well, you're a therapist. Like, I would assume you know somebody, right? Like, that's funny. Well, oh, nah, not really. Right. So it's like definitely barriers to finding resources and finding folks that people are seeking and looking for. Um, but also lack of knowledge, right? About one, what therapy is, what it looks like, and how culturally it might just be interpreted or, you know, how culturally how people might view this idea of going to somebody whom you don't know. You go tell and I hate to use the word tell, but yeah, I was gonna say you tell about things that are happening different culturally and do you have any mentors do i have any mentors i used to have a mentor um but you know he moved uh he's busy doing his own thing but right now i would say yeah some of my friends in ways are my mentors right um they've had more life experience than i have so i like to be asked them questions about stuff and also some of the organizations I'm a part of. So I am the vice president of the uh, Employee Assistance Program, well, Employee Assistance Professional Association, the Northwest chapter. So that um, encompasses Washington, Hawaii, and I think Oregon as well too. Um, and some of the folks in there, great, wonderful people, right? And they definitely have experience, one, working in this field, but also, you know, how to, help employees as well who are looking for resources. So those folks I can consider to my mentor. Or to and I guess it's safe to say with that organization and you're doing the TA stuff that you're, you're mentoring people yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have people who, you know, see what I'm doing, um, hear about what I'm doing and wanting, like you said, just asking questions about, hey, like, what can I do to, you know, have go, kind of go down this path, right? What does that look like? Um, I had a friend who, he says, I'm his mentor. He wants me. I was like, yeah, for sure. But basically, he just graduated with the, uh, his bachelor's in psychology and you know, was asking, hey, I, I know I want to be a therapist, but I'm not sure which path or which degree to pursue. Right? Do I pursue a, a graduate degree in psychology or can I do social work? Because right? he was very much about, you know, one helping helping the youth right um but also wanted to still be invested in the community right like because being a therapist uh, one our program is very much like individual right we're teaching about the individual how this things impact the individual versus i think social work which is a bit more broad right in terms of understanding how systems impact people right so i think depend on just his personal philosophy which one would be best and i was like well, I'm having this event called We Might We Matter. I'm going to have some therapists over there. I'm going to have some, some more social work, some who are, you know, from a psychology background. Why don't you speak with each of them and see which one you like? 
So he spoke with him, and he was like, Kelvin, I think I'm going to be a social worker. I was like, all right, there you go. He was like, that's, you know, your philosophy, and, you know, that's what you believe in. Go ahead and do it. So, yeah. And to be a therapist, you have to have a master's degree, correct? Yes. So if someone only has a bachelor's degree in psychology, what can they do as a career? You can do a lot with it. And that's, that's like the, you know, almost like, it's like a, call it a pro, but also a con in some ways. Because it's like, well, psycho- everything involves, you know, yeah. psychology in some way. So mm-hmm. you can go wherever. Um, I know when I got my, psych- my bachelor's psychology, I worked in a um, in treatment facility that worked with, like, adolescents, right, who uh, juvenile court was like, we're not going to put you in jail. We're just going to put you in, like, a little rehabilitation facility for a little bit, right? And I worked there as one of, like, the uh, facilitators, one of the uh, folks just making sure the program was running smoothly and right. And me came with the kids, talked with the kids, maybe have, like, you know, just conversation with them and stuff. So, yeah, that's one way you can go and it helped me to also like work on my active listening skills and you know just understanding you know how these different disorders that we learned in school actually look like in the real world especially for like, the young kids and stuff so. so as far as like your own personal career goals it'd be like maybe you'll have like franchises out have different like people working to you like you're gonna hire a team of therapists Man. in the future or just be are you just content like having your own company by yourself and you know making money that way I mean, I'll, yeah, that's that's nice. But also, I want to be able to create a company that can um, connect folks who are looking for therapists of color, right? So your psychology today, which has you know, pretty much everybody, right? But for folks who are looking, because again, I think it was like 4% of all therapists are black and like 6% is like Hispanic or Asian. Because yeah, because like, when we talk about the field, 87% of it is white. And the 30, 13% is split between everybody else. Mm-hmm. And it's like, as folks of color living in America is very stressful. And how can we find folks who can kind of help us process and we have the tools to be able to, you know, be more, I don't say be more resilient, but also just process, right? Make sense of some of the things that we might be experiencing that we might not have the language for, right? And where can we go to find that? And I want to be able to create a company that can help folks be able to find those resources. So, so based on the stats, how important is it to you like to make sure you're like a, a good role model so people look up to you and say, Hey, this guy, he's like he's a black therapist, he's yeah. presenting himself well, like he's doing the right thing, so to speak. Yeah, I mean I yeah, I gotta I gotta be good because like I want more people like me. Right. I, I want there to be more black male therapists, specifically black male therapists, because one, there aren't a lot. And two, I get a lot of just comments and phone calls, right, of folks who are looking for, say, either like male role models or mentors or even folks who can help with young black boys, right? Like, where can they go to be able to kind of share and talk with somebody, another black male, right, about what it's like to be a young black boy growing up in America, right? There aren't a lot of spaces for these young kids. Um, so, yeah. I, yeah, I guess in some way I have to be, you know, kind of like, yeah. yeah. There's some things you can't be seen doing in public, I'm guessing. Yeah, no, nah, man. <laughs> For um, sure. So, taking young kids, so like in the Seattle, there's like this big um, epidemic of like teenagers like yeah. killing each other. I think a couple of days ago, they, like these teenagers are like freaking machine guns at this parade, right? Yeah. Where do you think that's coming from? It's like, is that everywhere in the United States? Is this here? Like, it's just insane. Like, can't, I can't say, man. I can't say if this is like, you know, nationwide, but it does seem like, you know, when you go online, I mean, we're living in a different world right now, mm-hmm. right? Like, one, kid, growing up, I'm sure you're not, we weren't, we didn't have access to all this information, yeah, right? We didn't have access to all, like, these images of people's lives, yeah, right? And at a young age, our minds are very impressionable, mm-hmm. right? Like, as human beings, we're designed to kind of like be aware of the environment that we're in, make sense of it, and be like, okay, this is how we're supposed to act accordingly. If all I'm seeing, right, are people just being violent towards each other, right, I think I then develop the idea that, okay, violence is okay. Yeah. Right. But also, how present might your parents be? Right. Do they monitor how much, one, how much time you're spending on your phone? Do they monitor the things that you are? looking at on your phone 
And two, are they even present in your life? Because your parents aren't present. Again, going back to what we said about relationships and whatnot, you can feel as if no one cares about me. If no one cares about me, my life must not matter. That means I can go out and just do whatever, even if it's a very risky situation. Because, again, no one's ever told me that my life matters. No one's ever treated me in a way that my life matters. So, as the kids say, YOLO. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, from your point of view, does it even matter or does it really matter if a person is like, grow up in a single parent household or, or both parents in the home? I mean, I think the stats, right, kind of show that it's better to grow up in a two parent household than one parent. Just because, so I have some clients whom, I have this one client, um, they, you know, they were, we were working on a thing together for about two years, right? And him and his wife, you know, they were planning, you know, they were like, you know what, man, I think I'm ready for a family. I'm like, all right, cool. And it was like a couple months after we'd kind of been working and stuff like that, right? He's like, all right, cool for sure. You no, know, a couple months later, comes back, like, oh, so yeah, man, I think my wife's pregnant. I'm like, okay, cool, man. We we're talking about that. That's dope. Congratulations. Like, yeah. A couple months later, the baby comes up and I see the baby literally right there in session. My man's got like bags, bags underneath his eyes. I'm like, damn, bro, you good? It's like, yo, this might be the hardest, but yet the most exciting, funnest thing I've ever done. I don't know how to explain it, man, but like having this kid right here, it's like, it's hard, but it's also the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And this was like uh, the child growing up in a two parent household, right? Both parents, you know, were able to like work from home and stuff like that. I mean, they were tired. Imagine doing that as a single person. That's a lot. And you have more than one kid. Yeah, that's that's a lot, man. Because again, so, so it's like then, are you able to give these kids, you know, the things that they truly need fully to be able to develop and grow up to be well-functioning individuals and human beings, right? Because the kids, when they're growing up, the biggest thing that they crave is attention. If they can't give them that attention, that can have an impact on them when they get older, right? Again, going back to what we talked about attachment, if you don't give a child the attention that they are craving and needing, right, and also be able to guide them when they are going wrong, because these when they come in the world, they're like, oh, oh, my God, this is a party. What's going on? But they need somebody to guide them, otherwise they're going to fall in the ditch, maybe hurt, hurt themselves, right? If they don't have that. One, they're going to grow up thinking, like, I can just do whatever I want. Two, when they don't get the attention that they crave for, like, maybe doing something good or well, it says it interpret the message or internalize the message like, okay, well, nothing I do really matters because my mom doesn't care, right? Like my mom can't even say, you know, good job or thank you or anything like that. So what's the point? All these are having an impact on how they're seeing themselves and also how they're going to be in relationship with others when they get older. So yeah, man, raising a child is tricky. And, and the real thing is you can do all you can, but there is no even so, no such thing as a, perfect parent, even yeah. a two-parent household, right? You can only be what we call the good enough parent. You can just do your best. So, odds don't tell the details. There's been time when you're talking to someone in therapy and you're like, what the fuck you just say? Or, this has to be the craziest shit in the world. Or like, <laughs> what? Can you repeat that? I yeah. not hear you correctly. <laughs> There's no way you just said that. Yeah. I used to have a, this client whom, it was very interesting. This was happening like during, kind of during the pandemic a little bit. But, could tell bro was like wrestling with a lot right like um he grew up in a place where there weren't a lot of black people right so during the pandemic it happened he just like delving like i'm really trying and it was it was interesting because he was like he sought me out as a black therapist right this is before you know, george floyd and everything but it was like okay we're clearly talking about it we didn't say it outwardly right but it was clear like we were having conversation about all the like you know the racial tension that was going on in the country right and he's like yeah man Kelvin like you know I want to learn but it's like it's just a lot of like you know pushback right and I'm I'm afraid that like they might you know push too hard and this something might go wrong and I was like I didn't I didn't I, I wanted to ask like who's they but I, I didn't because I just wanted to just kind of go off and just kind of like even though we both you know we never set out right Pretty obviously, it was like, yeah, white people and black people. There might be a race. Like, okay, sure, but let's 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 talk about that. Sure, but you can tell my man was like struggling because like to like you know say it, but it's like I I I know what you're trying to say, but it's yeah. okay. Let's 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 talk about it. Let's talk about it. 
So, Calvin, can you give us your social media or any other ways for people to reach out to you? Yeah, yeah. So, my you can find me on Instagram um, at Pepper Counseling. And also my website, preppercounseling.com. You can send me an email at kelvin at preppercounseling.com. And you can find me on LinkedIn, too. You also do, I think, a free initial account consulting, like 30 minutes, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you'd like to work with me, I do a free 10, 15-minute consultation, right? And that's just to find out if, you know, we'll be compatible working together and also just to find out a bit more about what brings so how okay. deep does that get it's only 15 minutes i'm sure you don't can't get too deep but like no nah, nah, it just it's just more of like a you know like a cursory kind of like you okay know, what they're struggling with what yeah. they, what they need what they want but mm-hmm. okay. what they want to work on and you know what goals they might have you know okay. in therapy all right hey kevin thanks for your time today i really appreciate you of course thank you man for having me yes and to our listeners thank you for your time as well and remember to be great every day